Yeah, and the next talk, I'm very proud to announce we have a speaker who is coming in from sunny California. Um, he's an attorney, he's uh, working for Harvard, he's doing so many things and he's fighting for our digital rights. And I'm very happy to say hi, welcome. Thank you. Um, yeah. And uh, spot the surveillance is the topic. Um, we will see what we haven't seen before. And I'm very happy that you're here. And Kurt Absal, please let us know what's up. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Hello, everybody. My name is Kurt Opsall. I'm the Deputy Executive Director and General Counsel of the Electronic Frontier Foundation. I'm here to talk to you about observing police surveillance at protests. So why do we want to observe police at protests? Well, because pro protests are political expression. As the Council of Europe put it, the right of individuals to gather with other people and make their collective voice heard is fundamental to a properly functioning democracy. And this is a right which is protected by the European Convention on Human Rights and other international rights treaties. But surveillance can chill that right. And so knowing what technologies are in use can help you understand the threats to your privacy and security, as well as provide tools to advocate for limits on police use of surveillance. Surveillance that may chill people's right to express themselves on these public issues. Just as analog surveillance historically has been used as a tool for oppression, Nowadays, policymakers and the public have to understand that the threat posed by emerging technologies is a danger to human rights, and they need to understand this to successfully defend human rights in the digital age. So journalists who are reporting on protests and police action should know the surveillance that is in use. Activists who are advocating for limitations on police use of surveillance need to know what surveillance is being used to effectively advocate. And legal observers may need to document the use of surveillance at protests in order to challenge police actions at the protest or challenge police policies that are being used after the protest with the footage that they've obtained. So what do we go over today? We're going to provide a lot of information about various types of surveillance technologies in use by police around the world. Uh, we're going to where to look, what the appearance is, how it works, what kind of data they collect, and how they're used by police. And at the end, we'll have a few uh, other resources available for those who want to dive a little bit deeper on the topic. So police surveillance technology is everywhere. It's on the police themselves, on their vehicles, on the roadways. It could be above you, in the air, uh, surrounding you in the environment. It can be a lot of different places, and you need to know where to look. On uh, police officers themselves, you'll often find it in the form of either body-worn cameras or additional devices that they're using, which are basically mobile biometric sensors. Body-worn cameras are technology that's uh, come out and become more popular over the last decade or so. It originally was something that was being used uh, uh, as a way to provide police accountability that uh, give a record of their interactions with the public and maybe, for example, could be used to show police brutality or maybe deter police brutality. But there are two-way streets. The devices are often used to surveil protesters, and the footage may later be used to support arrests and charges. For example, we use this NPR story where uh, after a rally, uh, you know, weeks later, the police went, identified people through body cam footage, and brought action against them uh, for obstructing the roadway, which is part of the, you know, the civil disobedience of the protest, based on finding them on the body camera footage. They can go in a, a variety of, of places. So uh, if you're looking for body-worn cameras, you got to look in different places to see where they might be. So a couple places they, you might see them on the head, a head-mounted camera. So it might be on your glasses on the side, could be a, a lens right in the center. Uh, the center one is, is pretty hard to find. But uh, uh, the ones on the side, or it might be part of uh, either the glasses or maybe a helmet that they're wearing, are generally pretty obvious. These ones, they're not particularly common, but they do, they do happen. Uh, 
shoulder mounted cameras also a little bit less common but uh, uh they have an interesting feature in this case we're using the warrior 360 from blue line innovations as an example and it is a dome camera that looks all directions uh so 360 degrees off of the officer's left shoulder well most cameras like a uh, front-facing camera will capture only 180 degrees chest mounted cameras are the most common uh, and these are being used uh, very, very widely. Uh, we give some examples here from, from Amsterdam, uh, Matelberg, and from West Midlands Police uh, in the uh, EU, or well, soon to be not in the EU for a case of Britain. And there are several known types. Uh, Axon, Wolfcom, and WatchGuard are very common. Uh, they operate in similar manners, uh, though uh, uh, with some differences. And you can uh, uh, take a look at some of the examples that are available on those, their, those companies' web pages where they will explain the products they have on offer and see what matches up for your jurisdiction. Or you can also look in for news articles. Oftentimes, there's a news article about when the uh, first policy to bring body-worn cameras is introduced in a particular police department. Uh, there are also smartphone-based cameras, and these are kind of the, the low end. Uh, it's basically just an Android cell phone using its internal camera with an app that uh, does recording placed in a pocket so the camera is a little bit above the, uh, the cloth and can see forward. Uh, but it's also a very subtle technique. It, it could be easily confused if you weren't looking with someone just storing their, their, their phone in their pocket. Uh, it also might be clipped somewhere on, the, on their uniform. But if you see anything where the uh, camera is facing outward and it's attached to the officer, there's a good chance that that is a body-worn camera, at least that app is in play. And last on uh, the body worn cameras, we'll talk about the semi obscured cameras. So, this is an example from a company called Body Worn, sorry, a product called Body Worn, a company called Utility. And it is partially concealed. It basically looks like a button on someone's uh, you know, uniform that, if you're not looking closely, you might not uh, notice. But if you see, as you fill in, you know, it appears uh, where you would expect actually not to have a button. It's slightly larger. It looks a little bit different. It looks like a camera if you look up closely, but if you're looking at a distance and not particularly paying attention, you might not uh, see it at all. In addition to body-worn cameras, police will often use uh, mobile biometric devices. So these can be handheld scanners uh, or could be a tablet or uh, a camera phone. Um, and in some cases, it just is uh, a camera, which has a particular app on it. Um, but we'll see that uh, uh, you can sometimes tell whether they're using a phone or whether they're using it as a biometric scanner by the body language. So, for example, if the police officer is holding up the phone, uh, trying to capture someone's face, that is most likely because they have a, they're capturing a photo and they may be connecting that to a facial recognition application. Um, and you also will see mobile fingerprinting. So uh, here's an example in the United Kingdom. Uh, they have an app on the officer's phone combined with a fingerprint uh, scanning device. And it takes the people's fingerprints and checks them against some databases. One is a database of everyone the police have detained for putting it into the database and then checking against it for, for new people. And the other one is a database for uh, immigration. Uh, to collect it at the border when someone uh, comes into the UK. Uh, and this allows the, the police to do a very rapid check of uh, their, their, their records on somebody in the field. Some of these devices are multimodal. They'll do both of them. They'll be able to do, do fingerprints and uh, take photos for facial recognition. Uh, this here is the DataWorks Plus Evolution. Does it both. Um, and that can be you know, convenient for the officers, uh, but it's a little bit more dangerous to some liberties. Uh, and some of the body warm cameras, in this example, Wolfcom, uh, has a biometric capability built in, facial recognition. So it can uh, use its regular camera functions, and of course, all of them, if they take the picture, that picture could be uploaded to a database and facial recognition will be done later. But this one is designed to streamline that process. So I'll take a moment as an aside to talk about facial recognition in Europe. Uh, per Algorithm Watch, the organization says that there are at least 11 police agencies in Europe who use facial recognition. 
uh, as shown on the map here. The UK Court of Appeal found that uh, automatic facial recognition technology used by the South Wales police was not lawful. However, yeah, elsewhere in the UK, they are still using it. Uh, the Metropolitan uh, Police is doing uh, in, in London is doing a live facial recognition uh, throughout the city of London, and it contends that its situation is distinguishable from South Wales, so that ruling doesn't doesn't apply to them. We'll see how that turns out. There's also been some pressure on the European uh, Commission to put a ban in place or put restrictions on facial recognition. And uh, in uh, September, there was a quote from uh, the commissioners saying that they were considering whether we need additional safeguards or whether we need to go further and not allow facial recognition in certain cases, in certain areas, or even temporarily, which is not a particularly strong statement, but it is a, uh, at least they are considering the idea, and this is something that one can advocate for. In the United States, uh, a number of jurisdictions at the local levels, uh, cities, have put restrictions on their police departments so they cannot use facial recognition. It's a growing movement, and while a, a national or, or international law that would uh, limit police use of facial recognition would be the best for civil liberties, you can also start at your local level. All right, once we move beyond the police officers themselves, where else? Vehicles and roadways. And this can come up from, for the vehicles and roadways, both adjacent to the protests and within the protests themselves. So adjacent to the protests is looking at the exits and entrances to the protest areas. And they may use existing ALPR or place new ALPR uh, or ANPR, automated number plate research called ALPR in the United States. And these are cameras Generally, we point it towards a roadway to where cars will be that are designed to uh, take a picture, determine what the license plate uh, number plate is, optical character resolution. They will eventually, recognition, they will eventually be able to see what it is, check the database, and find out who's registered for that car. Um, and it can be uploaded to a central server for police to search, it can add vehicles to a watch list. Uh, it is a very powerful tool because many people uh, are using cars to get to and from protests, uh, and uh, even if they're they're going in a, in a group, at least one member of the group would have, have the car. Um, and it has been used to go after someone after a protest. So in this case, it was from a number of years back, but a, uh, a citizen in the UK uh, went to a protest and was later pulled over because they had captured the license plate while at the protest, added to a database, and then used that to pull them up. So if there is a protest, uh, the police might come in and use a portable number plate reader. Uh, so uh, here's some, some examples of what they might look like. They're either on a, uh, a tripod or on a little trailer. Uh, and they can set these up basically anywhere. Uh, it would often be used at the entrance or exit to the zone in which the protest is expected to see who's coming in or who's coming out uh, during the protest time period uh, and try to sort of capture the, uh, the crowd through their license plates. It also uh, is now becoming more and more common on police cars. Uh, you can see a couple of examples we have here. Uh, one shows it uh, rather obvious in, in the top one. That's a UK police car, and uh, you can see the camera sticks out fa fairly obvious that they have uh, a camera on, on the light bar. The lower one from the French police less obvious. It looks like an ordinary light bar. Uh, you might be able to tell that it's a little bit different uh, uh, than, than some other ones because uh, it has sort of a, a funny thing in the center. But it's a pretty subtle approach. Um, so there's all kinds. They might also be mounted on the hood or the trunk and, and may be more or less obvious. But take a look at cars. And also take a look at what the police car's behavior is. If they are driving, for example, slowly down the street next to a whole bunch of parked cars, uh, it may be that they are doing gridding, a practice known as gridding, where they're looking for capturing every parked car's uh, license plate in a particular zone that you're trying to run slow and steady in order to do that. Uh, and then there are the fixed number plate readers. Uh, these are often at traffic lights and intersections on the uh, highways. Uh, any sort of high speed uh, uh, toll road will have them. They also are, are, you know, they're used for other purposes like to uh, uh, establish uh, fines 
um, to uh, check uh, border crossings. They are very common fixtures on, on roadways. So if a protest happens in a zone that already has them, the police will be able to access that information and know who uh, entered or exited that area and who moved around. All right, and then within the protest itself, there may be adding additional surveillance capacities. So uh, in this example, we have a, the Santa Fe Police Department uh, knew about a protest that was protesting a uh, statue. Uh, and uh, I don't know, there's a question why maybe some people wouldn't take action and remove the statue. So in order to capture that through surveillance, they placed this trailer, which has a number of camera and audio capabilities, uh, and just rolled it in right next to the statue to capture the uh, protest action. Um, and these cameras can, can come in a variety of forms. Um, in this case, uh, we're at the watchtowers. Personal control cameras can be in, personnel controlling the cameras can be in the watchtower, or they can be operating it remotely. As you can see, uh, you know they, they are using a scissor jack to to raise it above that van. Uh, the other one is a uh, an assembly. It's not easy for someone to get in and out of there. So it may have a person, but it's somewhat inconvenient to, to actually have a person inside these uh, watchtowers. But it's much more convenient to use their built-in surveillance capabilities and remotely uh, observe the area around the watchtower with those cameras. And then there are also the pure surveillance units. Uh, this, this example here uh, showing uh, uh, four cameras, uh, raised pole, and just adding surveillance capability basically to anywhere. And some of the uh, uh, some of some of them are much more complex. Thermal imaging cameras. Uh, thermal imaging uh, often comes from the leading company is FLIR. That stands for Forward Looking Infrared. FLIR system makes a lot of these devices and makes them available to police departments. Thermal imaging cameras allow the police to be able to conduct surveillance after dark, where the lighting is poor, where they might not be able to identify uh, individuals very easily. Instead, they can use their heat signature and be able to uh, continue to monitor the protest when the lighting conditions are less. And a lot of things, a lot of protests will happen at night. Uh, candlelight vigils, very commonplace. Uh, so police will be looking to thermal imaging to make sure that they have strong surveillance capabilities after dark. Another thing you might see uh, around a protest is an emergency command vehicle. Uh, these are often massive bus-sized vehicles, uh, and they do have some surveillance capabilities. They might have some cameras, uh, but more often they are command and control, so they are the places where somebody would be receiving footage from cameras and operating cameras remotely, uh, making communications with other uh, people in the field, uh, though they also may have some built-in capabilities, and they may provide the focal point where through a local connection they're getting information from local devices, and then they have the uplink in the command center. One thing I wanted to point out is a common misconception or something that comes up uh, a lot when people are concerned about police surveillance is they'll see an unmarked vehicle, uh, a van with no windows. Uh, it may even have some antennas or, or satellite. And while that is possibly an undercover police vehicle, uh, you shouldn't assume that that vehicle belongs to law enforcement. Uh, that uh, could very easily be a news media vehicle. News media also goes to protests. They also have satellite uplinks and antennas. Uh, they look very similar. And in some cases, the uh, media uh, has a security situation there. They're worried that there may be theft of equipment, and they have unmarked vans. So uh, it is worth noting that there is an unmarked vehicle, but you shouldn't necessarily assume that it is a police unmarked vehicle. Also, sometimes people see, especially if they see some antennas or a satellite dish on a vehicle, that maybe that's where a stingray is. Uh, this is a misconception. Stingrays are pretty small, and they don't require an external antenna to operate. You could put a stingray inside uh, a, you know, the trunk of a car, uh, you know, maybe about briefcase sized. So it would be unlikely that uh, if, if you're going to use a uh, stingray or cell site simulator or MC catcher, that you would want to put it in a vehicle, uh, you don't need to put it in a vehicle that has its own antenna. 
Um, there have been uh, uh, not very much documentation of these technologies been used in the U.S. domestic protests. Uh, they have been used, uh, we know, in, in some protests in more authoritarian countries. Um, so it's unclear how often they will be uh, are, are being used. Um, and they are a very dangerous thing, simply. So an IMSI catcher, it is able to determine what cell phones are nearby, uh, get a unique identifier with that cell phone, and in many cases be able to use that information to determine what individuals are present in a protest. Uh, and that information has been used after some uh, protests in Ukraine, for example, to send a text message to people telling them that, you know, we're on to you, we know you were there, uh, which can be very intimidating to individuals. But the challenge is if you're trying to observe police surveillance and our protests, it is hard for you to observe it because they are often hidden. Uh, you may be able to find out more information later through investigative journalism or public record requests or news reports. If somebody is prosecuted using that information, it may become obvious, but it's difficult to see at the protest itself. So next category, look it up in the sky. There are uh, lots of forms of aerial surveillance. Law enforcement agency will surveil pro protests from above using traditional aircraft with onboard pilots and as well as smaller remotely operated aerial systems, drones. Uh, law enforcement may also use these aerial vehicles to communicate with the crowd, to use the loudspeakers to send a message to the crowd, order them to disperse. Um, and you know, we've seen this actually drones with uh, a loudspeakers being used by the German police in order to uh, tell people to stay apart. Corona, that same technology can be used for protests. Um, and these planes and drones will often be equipped with high definition cameras, capable of either an extremely wide angle to get the whole scene, or an extreme zoom where they might be able to zoom on a particular person, a uh, particular license plate, and then use that data later, partnering that the aircraft with license plate recognition, face recognition, video analytics, and even a cell site simulator inside the aircraft. And this, you know, we know this has happened in a recent uh, uh, protest uh, in Texas. A Texas police drone uh, caught some footage of a, of a protester allegedly throwing a water bottle. Uh, they took that video, they took the picture, put it out, offered a cash award, and an anonymous tipster turned the, uh, the kid in, and protest uh, uh, was prosecuted. So police are definitely using these things to gather information at protests. So a common uh, method for especially larger police departments uh, is fixed-wing aircraft. Uh, for smaller ones, they may use private contractors to provide these fixed-wing craft. So this is an example of the kind of plane used by a company called Persistent Surveillance Systems. It rents out a plane like this, well, not this exact one. If you look up that tail number, it's, it's going to be to a different company, but the same model of the plane, the Cessna 207. And these will circle around the protest uh, using their cameras to observe the protesters below. Uh, an advantage of planes is they can often circle for uh, quite a long time uh, and provide a, a wide view of the, uh, of the area. Also, helicopters. Helicopters will often be seen hovering over a protest. Uh, they are a little bit easier to maneuver and be able to go backwards and forwards over the protest uh, and are used by, by police to uh, continually observe. Uh, and we use two examples here, one of them from the Oakland Police Department, the other one from the Rhineland Police Department. In both cases, they have a FLIR attached to the helicopter, a forward-looking infrared that would allow them, in addition to regular cam capabilities, to use thermal imaging to follow someone uh, at a protest or follow what's going on after dark. Um, you can also uh, uh, see that some helicopters will have spotlights so that they can uh, uh, signal to officers on the ground who to follow, who to pay attention to. Um, and another thing for both fixed wing and helicopters, you look for the tail number. Uh, in most jurisdictions, they're required to have the tail number visible, and then you can look up that tail number on services like FlightAware and be able to uh, find out further information about what that plane has been doing, what the helicopter has been doing, as well as the ownership. Finally, drones. 
Drones are becoming uh, very commonplace because they're getting cheaper all the time and having additional capacities. Uh, drones are also known as unmanned aerial vehicles, UAVs, UAS, unmanned aerial systems, uh, and a lot of police departments are getting them for their capabilities using most commonly a quad rotor, um, and they can be controlled by remote control, have a uh, camera built into this, and be useful for getting an above the scene view. Um, so one way to spot it, well, first of all, just listen to it. They make kind of a distinctive noise. Uh, sometimes they'll be marked as police. Um, you can also look for the pilots operating nearby. So oftentimes a, you can sell a drone file. First of all, sometimes they're, they're labeled, like in the uh, upper left there, it says police drone operator. Pretty easy to identify. Uh, other times they might have like drone, UAV, aviation unit uh, on their uniform or on a nearby police vehicle. Uh, the other thing is that if you identify a drone, uh, they're often within line of sight is going to be the operator. So once you see the drone, look around and see if someone has the remote controls in their hand, is looking up at the drone, you can probably identify the operator and go look for information they might have on their uniform uh, about who is operating that, that particular drone. But also keep in mind, both for drones and other aircraft, that it's not necessarily the police. Uh, journalists and activists will often file, fly drones uh, over protests. News helicopters for a large protest are going to be more common than police helicopters. Uh, and many times they are labeled, which is a picture of the BBC news copter. Uh, but this means that just if you see a helicopter that has both a camera uh, and is flying over the uh, uh, protest, that does not necessarily mean that it's a police helicopter. Also, another technology, which uh, is actually not, not very commonplace outside of uh, uh, protests in uh, war zones, uh, but the drone killer technology, which is basically a ray gun that knocks drones out of the sky, sending uh, radio signals to uh, interfere with the, the drone's operation and cause it to fall and crash. Uh, these have been used in, uh, in Iraq and Afghanistan, uh, and the technology uh, could be starting used, but we really haven't seen it used more frequently. I just want to tell you about it because, oh my God, drone killers. All right. Last place to look for, for police technology in the environment around you. Uh, there will be, in many places, camera networks. So a lot of the cameras that you'll see in a neighborhood will have, will be private cameras, uh, will be police cameras, will be cameras being used by city uh, non-police agencies. There can be a lot of cameras. This also means that if you're trying to observe what cameras are going on, there's going to be like too much information. There'll be so many cameras in many areas that you can spend all your time documenting and observing the cameras and this other things. So you might not want to spend like all your time paying attention to that because uh, you can go back later at any point and see the fixed cameras. But there are a couple of things that uh, uh, you want to look for. So first, identifying them. There are too many different brands to identify, but here's some information about the kinds of, of cameras that are available. Uh, bullet cameras are directional, so you can sort of see which way it's pointing and what it would be covering from that. Uh, then you have dome cameras, which are designed so you can't see which way it's pointing, or at least you can see maybe somewhere in this, in this area, 180 degrees, but uh, the exact direction it's pointing is obscured by the dome. Um, pan tilt zoom cameras uh, can change which way they're pointing. They can uh, uh, sometimes be coupled with a dome camera so that the dome camera can both change the way it's looking and obscure which way it's looking. Uh, thermal imaging cameras um, and ALPR cameras are also going to be common at fixed locations. Uh, ALPR, a lot of having to do with, with, with traffic control. Thermal is actually not as common. Uh, that is mostly used uh, as, as a uh, technology that is uh, on vehicles. Uh, it's kind of expensive. Uh, but in this case, the, uh, the picture shown is a uh, thermal imaging camera. So sometimes people will go to that additional expense. Uh, and one subcategory of all the cameras that are in your environment are going to be police observation devices. This is sort of the category of sets of sensors which are operated by the police. And they may include multiple cameras, uh, gunshot detection, uh, facial recognition. Uh, for example, in the United Kingdom, 
As I said, the City of London is doing live facial recognition. Uh, so police observation devices are sort of a collection of these cameras in one location. Sometimes they're marked as police. Uh, sometimes they are, are not. Uh, and it is the way you would sort of suspect that it's a police observation device is if it has a lot of different sam- sensors in one location trying to cover the whole ground around, then that is the kind of thing that you would see most frequently from a police observation. Uh, and then finally, smart streetlights. Now, smart streetlights uh, are, have a number of wonderful ap- applications, uh, some initiatives like in the U.S., smart cities, in the EU, the E Street Initiative, are imploring cities to use smart streetlights because they can you know, turn down the power usage uh, when light is less needed. Uh, and there's some some advanced ones. A, a project by the Arnholt University of Applied Sciences uh, has a technology which will use uh, motion detection, sound detection, being able to tell if there are people walking nearby and brighten their path for them. Sounds great. But the same kinds of technology, being able to detect motion, being able to uh, have audio signals, video signals, can be used for surveillance. So here on the slide, we show uh, the smart lighting capabilities being advertised by Intel. Uh, In addition to uh, some things that you might expect, like uh, being able to adjust it for uh, traffic patterns, provide better lights, they talk about other things, crime investigations, monitor parking violations, uh, safety announcements that are coming from the smart cameras. So all of these technologies are, are possible. And... Hopefully, this will not become a commonplace use, but if it is, it would mean that a surveillance device is everywhere along every street where they're putting these devices in. Uh, If you blank in a city, you're blanking a city with surveillance. So has it been used? Yes. The city of San Diego uh, had a number of protests uh, surrounding the uh, protests around George Floyd, uh, and they used at least 35 times they searched information gathered through the smart streetlight network for uh, evidence in criminal cases coming out of that protest. So what additional resources are there? There's plenty of additional resources if you want to drive it more, and I encourage you to take this only as a starting point. There's a lot more to learn. So we'll start out with a very important resource. If you're somebody who's going to go, whether uh, as an activist, as a protester, as a journalist, you should prepare yourself uh, for some surveillance self-defense. ssd.eff.org. We have a attending a protest guide. You can go there and learn important tips on protecting yourself when you're going to the protest. Um, you know, put your device with full disk encryption, a strong, unique password, turning off the biometric unlock, use end-to-end encryption for messages and calls, uh, walking uh, or taking a bicycle to get to the protest instead of a, a vehicle, which can be subject to an ALPR, ANPR device. Uh, you know, wear a mask. You should wear a mask for COVID anyway, but uh, if you're going to wear a mask, get a big, the larger the mask, the more it protects you. Uh, and there's also recently a study that uh, showed that, um, that you know, they're making efforts to try and make uh, facial recognition continue on despite people's uses of masks. Uh, and there was a study that showed that red and black masks were harder for the AI to be able to uh, uh, determine who was behind the mask. So wear a uh, red or black mask. Uh, if you get one that covers more of your face, like a bandana, it's going to be harder for the facial recognition algorithms. So do some things to protect yourself, both from COVID and from surveillance. Uh, if you want to also just try and practice it out, uh, you can go to our uh, spot the surveillance. Uh, this is a uh, online uh, program. You can use a desktop version or a virtual reality version where it places you in a virtual street corner with some surveillance devices nearby, and you can look around and try to identify uh, all the surveillance devices that you see. It takes just a, a, you know, a few minutes to go through the exercise, but it's a good way to uh, practice your skills and identify what surveillance might be around on the street. And if you want to get a lot more information about uh, any of these devices, uh, go to uh, EFF's Street Level Surveillance Project, EFF.org slash Street Level Surveillance. Uh, this will provide more detailed information about various technologies that uh, are in use. 
Uh, that can be a good starting point, especially if you have found out uh, what is being used in your jurisdiction. Uh, you can go there and find out more about it. Uh, and you can also find out just what is going on more generally with these kinds of technologies. So EFF.org slash SLS. All right. Well, thank you. That comes to the close of my talk. Uh, thank you for turning in. And now uh, let me uh, turn it over to my future self for Q&A. Thank you. Welcome back. Thanks. Thanks so much, Kurt. So we have some time for questions and it's getting more and more. I'm just hurrying up. Okay. Are there devices, apps or services developed or run by private companies and who makes sure the data is not directly sold to third parties? So, yes, there are uh, private networks. I mean, one of the things we talked about uh, just now is there's a lot of private camera networks that are providing information to the police. Sometimes private networks uh, go into a registry where police are organized, ask people to volunteer, put their information into a registry. So they are sort of explicitly saying they're going to turn over their information to the police. Other things like Amazon's Ring camera. Uh, they have been promoting it as an anti-theft tool, trying to stop package theft at people's doors. But this also is creating a you know panopticon of everyone's doorbell camera. If they're all using Ring, will be uh, uh, provided. Uh, get the video, and it will provide it to the police. So, uh, and many of these uh, organizations, you know, if they're, if they're a larger one, they will have some some privacy practices, probably policies, but by and large, they will talk about the privacy of the person who owns the, the camera smart device and not really consider the bystanders, the people walking by. So if you have a doorbell camera at your front door, they can hear uh, audio, so maybe someone can ring your bell and, and say hello. It will also capture people walking by, and those people's privacy is important and should be considered. All right. Then we have, what hope do we have against all this? Which best case legal countermeasures do we have when attending protests? And another one which I would connect directly, is it possible to intervene against surveillance based on laws or presumption of innocence? Yes. I don't know if, if, if that's if German laws are meant, but maybe you still can say something. Well, I mean, so there's many different laws that might be at issue. I mean, we're, we have an international audience here, uh, but uh, I, I think there are some, first of all, some basic human rights principles that apply to many uh, jurisdictions. But I would say actually one of the most effective tools to push back against this kind of police surveillance is working locally with the uh, like a city, the mayor, the uh, city council, and uh, a number of locations have passed rules about what their police can do against their citizens. So putting limitations on what police can do at the local level where your activism in the city in which you live, taking things to your, your representative government uh, and saying, we need to have some, some limitations on this. We need to have it within civilian control. So the police themselves are not deciding what technologies to use, but it has to pass through an elected representative. And I think that is probably one of the most effective ways to at least start change where you live. Uh, but you can also try and, and promote that to uh, you know, national legislature, state legislatures, go up, uh, uh, up several levels. And one of the things that we hope comes out of this guide, you know, people getting more information about what kind of surveillance is available, is so that they can go to their representatives, go through the political process with the information of what tools to use. Ah, I saw you use body cams, they have drones flying above. Go to your, your representative and say, we need to make sure that, that the information that they're gathered is being used in a manner consistent with human rights principles, and we need civilian control from the local government on how to do that. Who is controlling the control instances? Yes. Yeah. Okay, we have more questions. Uh, okay. So the police operate equipment like AMPR reader, IMSI catchers, etc., that get information that they could get in a cheaper way, like uh, reading traffic uh, signs or license plates or uh, cell info from operators. Um, is there a reason for that? Um, especially uh, concerning EU, because US differs a lot. Um, and another question, have, has police in EU, US been known to use illegal or questionable tech for surveillance? 
So uh, I think I'll hurt the uh, first question uh, is about you know using things like uh, ANPR to determine uh, license plates. Uh, this this technology is is common in the uh, in European Union, uh, though by and large it is being put in place for other reasons, not not to get after protesters necessarily. They're looking for uh, you know making sure that people are paying a, a toll or it might be a speed trap on the Autobahn where it uh, takes a picture of the license plate of anyone traveling uh, over a, a speed limit uh, in the places that have speed limits, part, only part of the Autobahn. Uh, and I think uh, also uh, it's being used for enforcement of things like uh, traffic citations. Your, your car's parked in a location too long. They know who to send the bill to. Uh, and I think these technologies could be repurposed for, for surveillance, uh, and that's what we really need is policies that are ensuring that if these things are being used for uh, a purpose that the sort of the citizenship agrees with in that jurisdiction to enforce parking, for example, uh, that is not also being repurposed uh, against uh, political activities and, and being used at a, at a wider scale than than it was envisioned. Also, maybe you know it's it's not a good thing to have perfect parking enforcement. Uh, you know, uh, a lot of parking fines were based on the notion that like you might not get caught every time, and when you change it, where uh, a system where previously uh, the fines were set with the notion that a lot of people would get away with it. You had to like make an example of those who didn't. And then you change that to perfect enforcement because the, the mm. computer, the ANPR system, surveillance knows exactly the minute that, that uh, a fine is due and then assesses that fine. That actually changes the dynamic of power between the citizenship and the state significantly. And it will often be phrased in forms of, well, we're just trying to enforce the existing laws. Well, how would you be against that? But really it changes the dynamic and it's something that uh, for those who want to be an activist on this, again, talk to your, your local jurisdiction and try and make sure that these things have safe and sane policies that respect human rights. So I would interpret that like uh, prevention of um, don't don't come into the idea that you need to to protect your data, right? <laughs> Fine. Yeah. And, and uh, just turning to the other one, you know, uh, do we do we have information about whether uh, police are, are misusing these technologies? So, I mean, there's some isolated examples uh, where uh, people have misused their technologies, and I, I used a couple of them in, in the slide. So there was someone who went to a political protest, their car was put into a database, they got pulled over later. Uh, and then uh, also in uh, uh, South Wales, the court found that there, the police use of facial recognition was in, in violation of uh, UK law, uh, though, as, as I noted, uh, not you know, the Metropolitan Police in London don't agree with that, and they say it doesn't apply to them. And I think actually use of facial recognition technologies um, is a very tempting thing by the police. They want to use it as much as possible, makes it, you know, easy for them. Uh, and, and I think you will, you will see that. But the other piece of this is unless there are rules that say, here are limitations on how you can use these technologies, then they can use them without having to risk violating the rules. So we need to have those rules in place. I hope that uh, the, the uh, Council of Europe uh, puts a, at least a moratorium on facial recognition for use for police. And, you know, until we can figure out how to use this technology safely, like it's kind of cool that you can unlock your phone or your face without having to type in a password, but we want to make sure that technology is used properly. Okay. So I think you're going to be around in the 2D world. You're going to explore that. You told me before. Yeah, there's more questions. I hope maybe maybe you find him in the 2D world and you're just asking there. Thanks so much. Right. Thanks so much. Thanks, nice having you. Bye, Kurt. Bye. -bye.